Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, Solidarity with Palestinian Workers Under Occupation. Obviously, tomorrow is May Day, International Workers' Day, so we're having this event ahead of that. Um, as, as I'm sure you, lots of you are aware, Palestinian workers are facing constant pressures of living and working under the Israeli military control um, of the occupation and siege, and COVID-19 is adding uh, a new dimension or a, a new difficulty for them, a new set of deadly dangers um, and uh, exacerbating the situation. Uh, this includes the almost complete closures, leaving very little resources for the survival of Palestinians behind the wall, checkpoints and trapped in the Gaza Strip. Um, so we're really looking forward to hearing from our speakers this evening. My name's Louise Regan, I'm Vice Chair of Palestine Solidarity Campaign, but I'm also a National Officer for the National Education Union. Um, you've all hopefully managed to get in successfully. You're all muted, uh, just so you're aware. That's just because it helps with background noise. Um, we've got uh, three people who are going to speak to us this evening. So we've got Abed Dari, who's the field coordinator from the Palestinian Workers Department of Kavlaved. Um, and um, they're going to update us about the situation there. Samia al who's the Assistant Professor in Labour Economics and the Dean of the Faculty of Business and Economics at Berze University in Palestine. Um, I've heard Samia speak a number of times about workers' rights, actually, and um, if you haven't heard her speak, you'll be very impressed. She'll give us a really good update on the current situation. Um, and we've also got, well, I'm really pleased, we've got Mariella Cohen, who's the Senior International Officer from the TUC here. Um, who's going to speak as well to us. So we're hoping all of the uh, internet stays uh, good enough for all of us to be able to do this successfully. Um, there is a chat box, so um, lots of you, I'm sure by now, as most of us uh, are, are very used to Zoom meetings because that's what we seem to be doing all the time. So if you've got questions for any of our speakers, please put them in the chat. I'm going to monitor it and I will be putting questions to our speakers but also introduce yourself as people are already doing, which is very lovely. So we can see who we've got. Um, we, will be share, uh, we will be saving the chat at the end of the meeting anyway. So any questions that get put in there that don't get picked up, we'll make sure um, we try and answer those. Um, so I don't know, I'm just gonna check because one of our speakers hadn't arrived. So I'm just gonna check uh, if they have, and then we, yes, Abed has arrived. Yes, I can't see uh, Abed, so I can't let, I can't unmute him. So I don't know if somebody out, I don't know if you can do that, Martial. Okay, so I'm going to hand straight over to Abed. Um, hi. And, hi, excellent. <laughs> I can find you. Uh, there's lots of people on the screen. So good, uh, I'm straight over to you. It's very lovely to see you. Um, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay. You want from me to, 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 to begin to talk? Okay, okay. Please, uh, please you go now. Yeah. Uh, my name is Abid Dari. I am uh, from east of Jerusalem. I am working in, uh, with the Kavla of Ed. It's an institution, it's non-profit organization aimed to protecting Palestinian rights. Uh, I'm working as a field coordinator in West Bank. Uh, I will talk about the Palestinians workers inside Israel and the settlement. I will talk in common. Then I will uh, talk at the end, I will talk about the Palestine, the situation with the coronavirus. Uh, we are talking about more than 130,000 work, Palestinian work in Israel and in settlement. More than 100,000 in Israel with a permit and 13,000 in settlement with a permit. And there is another uh, group of workers without a permit. Uh, we are talking uh, about more than 35,000 Palestinian workers without a permit. Uh, the main sector that the Palestinian workers work is in industrial, in agriculture, and in, the, in construction. According to the Israeli labor law, they should pay for these workers the minimum wage and pension 
and severance pay, uh, overtimes, holidays, and sick days, all of the rights that he must get inside Israel, it is also uh, should be implemented for the Palestinians. In settlements, in the industrial zone, and in agriculture, most of the workers did not get the minimum wage and the other benefits. Uh, if we are talking about the problems that the Palestinian workers uh, faces uh, in their work, even inside Israel in the settlement, it will be in uh, some points. Uh, because of the corruption, many of the employees illegally charging the workers for a permit. The Palestinian workers paid between 2,500 shekel to 3,000 shekel pay for each permit every month. Uh, Israel and, and the Palestinian Authority knows about this, what happened, that the Palestinian workers pay for the permit. A lot of Palestinian workers pay for, for a permit. Even if it's free, they must get a permit to work inside Israel or in, inside Israel uh, without paying any penny. But many of the workers paid for that uh, permit. Uh, in the settlement, in the settlement, according to the Ministry of Judge, uh, any Palestinians want to sue his employer, uh, he must pay a deposit in the court between two thousand to three thousand shekel for the court before they began to to see his case if against the employees. So many of the Palestinians who work in the settlements, especially in the agriculture sector, uh, uh, cancel their cases against this, their employers because of this uh, deposit. They didn't have the money to pay. The other thing in common, when there is a work accident for Palestinian workers, according to the law, they must get a treatment inside Israel. But what has happened is most of the uh, Israeli employees uh, send the Palestinian workers to get the treatment inside territories, inside Palestinian, inside West Bank. So they must pay for their treatment uh, for uh, six days from their pocket money. Uh, so uh, if the, the if the workers didn't go to to, to get the treatment inside Israel, uh, he will not uh, get uh, the for the sick days and the disability. The 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 last the last thing I, I would uh, to mention about the Palestinian workers it's the fake the fake pay slips. Most of the Palestinian workers uh, or many 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 of the Palestinian workers didn't uh, get or take the pay slips from the employer. And usually, the, the pay slips is faked. What is the meaning of it? That the workers, he, if he agreed with the employees to give him per a day, uh, to say 300 shekel, but what is written in the pay slips, it's less than. It's near the minimum wage. So many of the Palestinian workers they didn't get their rights as they are. They should. Uh, the employees did not dec declare about the contents of the uh, pay slips. Uh, in fact, uh, the Palestinian uh, authority didn't have anything to do with these problems. They didn't have the power to change the situation. Uh, we, we, we usually try, all the time, try to mention these problems that the Palestinian workers in common, even in settlement or even inside Israel, that they are facing these problems and they must get uh, a change. We, we tried a lot. We uh, use the Supreme Court to, to enforce them to change the situation. But uh, in fact, sometimes we succeed, and in the other time we did not succeed. Now this is in common. I will mention about the period of Corona that we are involved, all of us, about this. According, according to the agreement between the Israeli authority and Palestinian authority, 
they gave a permit for more than 65,000 Palestinian workers to get inside Israel and to sleep inside Israel. This is unusual. Then the usual, the usual thing is when you are, you want to go to work inside Israel, you are going to inside Israel, and this, in the same day you would come back to your uh, village or to your uh, city. This because of the Corona situation, and they want to uh, to to keep the situation not to infected. They ask for the Palestinian workers to sleep inside Israel uh, for two months. They asked them. If you want to go to work inside Israel, you should sleep inside Israel for two months, not coming back to Palestinian territories. So, uh, they, uh, the, the, condition, the, the, the condition that they should go, they will, the employees must manage for the Palestinian workers a suitable place to sleep and to check every day if they are sick. To check the Palestinian workers. This is that the, 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 the main uh, agreement between the Palestinian uh, Authority and Israel. But what happened? A lot of workers came back to the West Bank when they go inside Israel. They, after many days, they came back. When they asked them what is happening, they said the condition for sleeping is very bad. It is not suitable for humans. So. Many of them, they began to work their back. Some of the workers, after many days, feeling sick and began to, 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 to afraid to stay inside Israel. They asked the employees, take me to hospital. They refused because there is no cover for them, for no, uh, to, no cover for them to take the treatment. So they sent them to Palestinian uh, territories near the checkpoint, the nearest checkpoints. Uh, there is a there is a, a special uh, uh, what we call it. It's a, uh, evidence that happened in Ezra in uh, Atarot settlement, settlement. It's near Jerusalem. There is a slaughtery for chickens. There is between twenty to thirty workers there infected by the corona, what is what happened? Israel did not take them to to be isolated inside Israel or to take the treatment. They sent them directly to Palestinian territories and to take their treatment there. At this time, the Palestinian Authority asked all the workers to come back to come back to their homes and she didn't allow for any workers, even in settlement or inside Israel, to go to his work. That is what happened in the uh, period of Corona. We can say that the main problems that they faced the Palestinians recently in the, in the, in the, in the, in the of the virus of Corona, there are many of the problems. The, mess, the Israeli government does, does not conduct coronavirus test for them. When they go inside Israel, they didn't, they could, didn't, does not conduct coronavirus test for them. The government bodies are avoiding responsibility for their health if they infected. Many of employees pledged to provide accommodation, a place enough for the workers, equipment for checking, suitable ventilation, all the needs, laundry, toilet, they didn't provide for these Palestinian workers. If any workers infected from Corona, he is not covered to take the treatment. They didn't give them a treatment because of the complicated situation. Many of workers fired from the work, even in settlement and inside Israel, because they didn't have the ability to come back to their work. They fired them. They, the employee asked them to come back. They said. The Palestinian Authority did not allow for us to go inside Israel or to go to settlement. They fired them. The Israeli, the, the Israeli workers, when they stopped them because of the virus, virus of Corona, Israeli insurance institution paid for them for the uh, they are in home. But the Palestinians who stay in home, 
Nobody paid vote for him, even Israel, even the Palestinian Authority. This is the situation for the Palestinian workers inside Israel and inside the settlement. Any question, I am pleased to answer it. Brilliant. Thanks um, very much for that, Abed. Uh, we've had a few questions, but we're going to take all of our speakers and then I, I will come to the questions um, okay. at the end. So we'll just mute you, Abed, while we have our other speakers. Um, I'm hoping that somebody else will do that so that I don't have to. Thank you. Um, and uh, somebody's asked Abed's role. I think that's been put in the chat and I think a link to Kavlaved has also been put into the chat. So, and again, we will share all of these links out after this event. So please don't worry about that. Um, in my distraction around my uh, lack of speaker, I forgot to mention at the start, um, obviously this has been organized by Palestine Solidarity Campaign and I hope all of you are members. If you are not, please do join up and make sure your trade union branches are joined uh, affiliated to PSE as well, but some of you may have seen yesterday that we had a really big win. So since 2017, Palestine Solidarity Campaign has been fighting the UK government around the right to, to take uh, BDS campaigns, to boycott divestment and sanction campaigns. And yes, it went to the Supreme Court and yesterday we heard that we had won and we have defeated the government. So that was a really positive thing for us. We're really pleased about that. We think that BDS is a really important part of our campaigning tools and we think it was absolutely disgraceful that the government was trying to prevent us taking that sort of action and preventing um, government pension schemes from divesting. So we're uh, very pleased about that and I'm sure Samia will be very pleased about that too. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to pass on now uh, to uh, Samia who uh, is going to talk to us um, about workers' rights and I've already got some questions for Samia as well. So we've got plenty of questions coming in. Uh, so I will hand over to you. I'm going to pin you and uh, and hopefully you'll be there. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Louise, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, that's a great note, actually, to start uh, my talk on um, since there has been such a huge attack on BDS. So fantastic. Great work, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a workers' uh, rights situation and I'll try to mostly focus on the West Bank and Gaza since Abed talked very much about Palestinian uh, workers. Um, I mean, we've been under lockdown since uh, the 5th of March, actually. We're one of the first areas to go under lockdown because we have a very, very poor health uh, system. Um, we have 120 ventilators in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. This is like the lowest number of ventilators ever. So as a result, um, I mean, for the first time in the history of the Palestinian Authority, they actually acted swiftly and uh, implemented uh, lockdown, uh, schools, universities, you know, all sorts of uh, spheres of life has been uh, um, restrained uh, very much in the West Bank and also in Gaza. The problem happened with Jerusalem, actually. Jerusalem, uh, Palestinians in Jerusalem had to, in a way, uh, live under Israel's directives. So they couldn't. People still had to go to school. People had to go to work. And uh, we, we see now the impact on Jerusalem is much, much uh, bigger than the West Bank and uh, Gaza Strip. 65% of the uh, uh, COVID virus uh, cases are in Jerusalem and the Jerusalem area. So uh, the vast majority of cases are developing uh, there. And of course, workers are getting very badly hit within uh, Jerusalem. Uh, within the West Bank, the early lockdown actually, uh, in a way, saved us. Uh, we have uh, something like uh, 500 and uh, uh, seven cases. 65% um, of these are in Jerusalem, which is very telling that the areas that the Palestinians do not have control over have been the areas that uh, were mostly uh, affected. The worst part is actually the treatment of Palestinians in Jerusalem. They are not getting access to Israeli uh, healthcare 
At the same time, Israel actually blocks the Palestinians from providing any healthcare uh, facilities for the Palestinians. So they're really in a very, very vulnerable situation. Um, they're not, uh, uh, Israel is not protecting them. Israel is not allowing them full access to the healthcare system. It's not allowing Palestinians to uh, provide uh, any healthcare to uh, uh, Palestinians inside Jerusalem. So it's, it's really total chaos in, in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, I will share with you some statistics about workers before we, uh, uh, so we can, in a way, uh, let me see. So we can, in a way, just look at the situation of workers within uh, the West Bank and uh, Gaza. I just prepared a few slides. Uh, can you see that? Is, has it shared uh, properly? Okay, very well. So here I just have a, a slide which is... Um, uh, it just looks at where Palestinian workers work. Uh, Palestinian workers, the number of Palestinian workers, there are around a million, just over a million uh, workers. Um, the vast majority, as you can see, the vast majority of Palestinian workers are in the services sector. More than 60% of Palestinian services uh, are basically health, education, restaurants, uh, uh, um, uh, transport, all of that is comes under uh, services. Um, the second uh, largest employer is the manufacturing sector. Agriculture, very little. Seven percent of Palestinian workers are in the agricultural sector and construction, 17 percent. Uh, this actually uh, also includes Palestinian workers in Israel. Uh, Palestinian workers in Israel Um, the, the, the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics estimates their number at the moment to be 140,000 Palestinian workers, totally from the West Bank, since there are no workers coming from uh, the Gaza Strip. These, they account for nearly 14% of the uh, labor force. As Abd explained, they mostly work in uh, construction and um, in agriculture um, and they earn much more. They earn uh, nearly double uh, uh, what would they earn on uh, the West Bank. Uh, their wages account for 25% uh, of all wages in uh, the Palestinian territory. So they account for 14% of workers, but they actually earn 25% of all uh, wages. So uh, these workers are significantly important for uh, uh, income uh, provision uh, within the West Bank. Um, now, given uh, uh, this situation that workers within the West Bank and Gaza are mostly in, in the uh, services sector, there is 14% uh, of these work uh, in Israel they earn more in Israel. Uh, the fact, what uh, Abed explained in terms of Israel asking Palestinian workers to remain uh, in their work in Israel, and then Israel not actually providing uh, a living space for these workers. Uh, I mean, I have cousins who, who went, I mean, who kept on going uh, to their work, and basically they were sleeping on the I mean, the, the weather is freezing. The weather was freezing in March. They were sleeping under uh, bridges in uh, unfinished uh, uh, buildings and, and uh, so on. So the situation was, uh, was really terrible. So as a result, the PA asked them to come back. Many of them did. Many of them stayed. Uh, many of them, which actually created uh, more cases, many of them kept on trying to cross into Israel. What Israel did, actually, Israel for the first time started creating holes in the wall, gaps. Israel itself started trying to attract Palestinian workers to remain in Israel. It wants Palestinian workers to work in Israel, to continue to support the Israeli 
economy, but did not want to take responsibility for these workers. So what Israel did is opened uh, cracks in the wall and soldiers which actually would actually stand uh, at the wall and let Palestinian workers into Israel. And if the PA notices and tries to uh, uh, deter these workers from entering Israel, is Israeli soldiers would shoot at Palestinian policemen. So the situation, I mean, it's, it's really bizarre. Things went upside down uh, that Israel is trying to get Palestinians to enter Israel and the Palestinians are trying to prevent the pal Palestinian workers from entering Israel. And there were actually two, so, two Palestinian policemen who were shot as a result. And uh, so this bizarre situation resulted in these workers, unfortunately, crossing into Israel, coming into the West Bank, increasing the cases of COVID-19 because the, uh, the infection rate is, in Israel is much, much higher than the West Bank. And uh, so the areas adjacent to the wall, the areas inside um, around Jerusalem where it's more easy to cross into Israel became the, uh, the areas of uh, uh, infection. Actually, 75% of those infected in the West Bank are either Palestinian workers in Israel or their families. So work in Israel has become the main reason for getting infected uh, uh, by this uh, virus, unfortunately. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of impact of the virus on the Palestinian uh, economy, uh, of course the Palestinian economy was was badly hit. It's a very fragile economy. The size of the economy is 16 billion dollars, which is you know the size of basically a big uh, company. It's it's ridiculous, but that's the size of the economy. The losses so far, as estimated by the Palestinian Central, of, uh, Central Bureau of Statistics, stand at 2.5 billion. Uh, that's a reduction in GDP by 15%. Uh, the, uh, in a way, the sort of uh, what happened in 2008 was similar, a reduction in, uh, in gross domestic uh, product in the size of the economy. There were losses to consumption, of course, losses to investment and rises in unemployment. Unemployment basically shot up. Uh, services are the highest employer of Palestinian workers. Services were shut down. You have all the uh, trade sector, uh, restaurants, um, the only places, the only businesses that remained uh, uh, at work are grocery shops, supermarkets, pharmacies, and bakeries. Everything, everybody, every other business had to uh, close down. Um, of course, the backward and forward linkages to these uh, businesses were also affected. Hence, people uh, couldn't, uh, people lost uh, uh, their jobs. Um, there was the issue of also closing down uh, schools meant that uh, parents had to stay at home to care for their uh, children. And of course, you know, our society is highly patriarchal. Hence, if there were men and women working, it was expected that women would stay uh, at home. Um, the Palestinian Authority, di in a way, issued directives that uh, workers should receive uh, at least half of their pay. That's the directive, that's the official position. Uh, we know that the vast majority of workers didn't get anything. Um, and uh, how they basically survived in the past two months um, is, uh, is through uh, social solidarity. People bailing each other out mostly um, and uh, the sectors that actually continued to, uh, uh, to work uh, try to uh, bail out uh, others. So if somebody is working, this, this person is actually supporting their families and other uh, families uh, too. This is a mechanism that we as Palestinians have always used. And this is what we did in 2000, 
uh, and one intifada for four years. This is what happened in the first intifada, and again, this is what happened, what is happening uh, now. Uh, the PA is trying to, um, in a way, create uh, funds uh, to support workers. Um, I mean, that will be helpful for sure, but you can, you know, support workers through funds for a month or two, but you cannot, you know, that's not a long-term strategy. And a long-term strategy probably has to think differently about the Palestinian economy, particularly its relationship with Israel. I mean, the pictures of seeing how Israel dealt with Palestinian workers that were suspected of having the virus. Um, Israel would literally dump these workers at the checkpoint, literally. And we see that filmed on, on you know, Palestinian uh, uh, TV. So Israel would open the door of the car or, you know, the uh, military jeep, push the Palestinian worker out of the car and then call the Palestinian Authority or, you know, the municipality or whatever, there is somebody, we've just dumped somebody at the checkpoint. And, uh, uh, and then this person, uh, uh, somebody goes to pick, pick him up. They're mostly men because 99% uh, of Palestinian workers uh, are men in Israel. Um, so, uh, so seeing these pictures and how Israel actually used these workers and the moment these workers were infected, they weren't handed over to the Palestinians. They weren't, the, the manner with which Israel uh, uh, dealt with Palestinian workers was typically uh, uh, fascist of, uh, of Israel. Um, and in a way, I mean, uh, not just economically, for, but from a political perspective, that brought it out to the Palestinians yet again that Israel does not even consider us as uh, human beings. And, and basically, uh, Palestinians probably have to uh, start thinking again about uh, uh, mechanisms to uh, separate themselves economically from the Israeli economy, uh, from creating a more uh, uh, egalitarian uh, uh, economy. Uh, that includes uh, self-reliance, more self-reliance. So there has been more calls towards engaging more in agriculture, but not agriculture in terms of uh, let's just uh, plant our gardens. No, but you know, rethinking about productive uh, 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 mechanisms uh, to enhance the agricultural sector, the manufacturing sector, so that these workers do not need to uh, cross into uh, Israel and have their lives at stake. Because these workers crossed and the moment they came back, they infected their families. Um, so in a way, they had to cross to survive and be, uh, ended up uh, uh, bringing in a way death to their uh, to their families um i think in a way it's it's an important time to um again reveal how fascist israel is uh, the manner with which palestinian workers were uh, treated uh, uh, in a way to preserve its economy, it closed down its economy, it protected uh, Israelis, and the people who kept the economy working were uh, the Palestinians. Uh, and the moment the Palestinians tried to protect themselves, Israel attacked them. Um, and uh, in a way that uh, uh, pushed the Palestinians and is pushing us to think differently about work in Israel. It was very much taken that we always want to go and work in Israel because of the wages and the proximity and all of that. So this, this brought it uh, home to us that, um, you know, it's not just livelihoods, it's the lives of people that are uh, at stake. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's actually strengthened uh, thinking about uh, boycotting Israel and 
uh, institutionalizing uh, the boycott of Israel into the economic uh, sectors. So there are more more calls uh, of uh, of that and how to do that and how to, uh, in a way, uh, make it uh, more universal. Um, and um, I mean, finally, um, as as workers everywhere here in 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 Palestine, workers have been uh, at the front line uh, during this uh, epi uh, pandemic. Uh, their lives have been uh, at stake. Palestinian workers in Israel, the, their case has been particularly uh, interesting. Uh, the losses to the Palestinian economy uh, have been huge. The manner with which the international community deals with the Palestinians, again, more um, funding and uh, uh, debt. So we're getting out of the situation with even more and more uh, uh, burdens to the Palestinians and uh, their livelihoods. Um, there is also the issue of uh, reinforcing and strengthening neoliberal uh, policies. The World Bank is using it, uh, using this occasion again to strengthen uh, neoliberal policies uh, within the West Bank and Gaza because it's it's the party that is providing uh, the aid. So, uh, in in a way, people are seeing the outcomes of this horrible new, neoliberal policies, but at the same time they're, they're getting strengthened because the resources are being provided by uh, the international community through the, uh, the World Bank. Uh, in a way, the situation is very uh, volatile. It's, we cannot, uh, our adherence to the lockdown cannot protect us. And that's because of workers in Israel, which Israel is using to strengthen its economy. It's another phase of, you know, how colonization or, or another mechanism, how colonization actually uh, uh, works. Let me just go back to the chat. Please tell me when I have to uh, stop because I, I just... Uh, you're very close to time, Samia, so if you could sum up now, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically what I wanted to, to say, and uh, it, it's better actually to, to see your questions. That might bring up uh, uh, other issues. But, you know, the entire world is sort of dealing with the, uh, with the repercussions of, of this virus and this pandemic. And here, the, the manner with which we are having to deal with the repercussions of this pandemic are compounded by colonization. So we cannot, in a way, this colonization does not allow us to protect ourselves. And we've tried and we've succeeded in as far as our communities are concerned, but this external power, colonial power, does not even allow us to, uh, to manage our uh, healthcare, which is very, very vulnerable, healthcare system, and and uh, protect ourselves. I'll stop here. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Samia. That was uh, extremely informative, as always, and we've had quite a few questions come in to you, so I'll go through those shortly. But for now, um, oh, Samia, if you could just exit your screen sharing as well, because I can't see you Oh, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. You've disappeared. Um, so um, just before I, um, I bring in Mariella, I just want to point out, obviously, just like all organisations, we're having to do lots of our um, actions virtually now. So please make sure you check out our website and sign up for updates. We have got quite a lot of actions coming up. This is an, one of a number of webinars that we have, um, we have done and, um, you know, people seem to really enjoy them. And it's brilliant that we get to hear Palestinian voices at these so um, it's been really positive from that point of view um, but we have other actions that we're asking people to do contacting their MPs about ending the blockade um, and we've got boycott actions that we're calling on people to take and we've got we will have an event coming up obviously for Nakba day so do sign up check out the website regularly and follow us on social media and I'm sure somebody will drop all of the links to the various actions into the chat at some point before the end of this session and uh, we'll also um, make sure we email those out to all of tonight's participants. 
Um, I'm going to hand over to Mariella now, who's uh, the Senior International Secretary from the TUC here in the UK. But unfortunately, I've lost all of my participants off my screen, so I'm hoping that Marcia will be able to uh, unmute her and pin her, and then I will see if I can sort out my screen while she's speaking. So let's see if she appears. I'll see if I can find her here. <laughs> Come on, Marcial. Ah, I've got it. I found it. I can unmute it. Okay. <laughs> Mariella, I'm unmuting you. Can you hear me now? Lovely, but I can't pin yeah. you. I can hear you. Great. Thanks, Louise. Um, and thank you so much to the Palestine Solidarity Campaign for the invitation um, and really to the affiliates of the TUC for all, all the work that's been done on Palestine. I think it's important to recognise PSC's efforts at the moment in the current crisis. Um, really how they've adapted their solidarity work um, has been really impressive and I think a lesson to a lot of the solidarity campaigns at the moment. Um, and it's a real honour to share the panel with the sister and brother from Palestine. I think really what I wanted to do was bring a message of, of solidarity and support from the TUC and also just to express our concern about the devastating impact of COVID and what that means for Palestinian workers and, and the Palestinian people. Um, the TUC has long standing policy, as many of you will know, on Palestine. We've chosen Palestine as one of our four priority countries for international solidarity um, and it's really you know workers rights but fundamental human rights are workers rights and it's an expression of the internationalism of the trade union movement um, the ITUC the International Trade Union Confederation has classified Palestine as a place where there's absolutely no guarantee for workers rights um, so it's a concern for the international movement and that's reflected really in, in the work that we're trying to do. Um, so we're looking really at where we can use our leverage, where we have influence, where we can try and make a difference to support our sisters and brothers in, in Palestine. Um, for example, on trade negotiations, uh, just yesterday our lead on trade was in discussions with the with government officials about trade deals that are rolling over um, from EU and expressed our concern about the UK-Israel negotiation um, agreement. We're looking at where we have influence on supply chains and um, where we can pressure British companies um, to implement our policy um, and implement our policy around corporations that are complicit in the arms trade, in the settlements. Um, we have a policy of campaigning for divestment and boycotting um, companies who are profiting from the illegal settlements, from the occupation and the construction of the wall. And we're looking also at how we work um, with the international trade union movement, because that's really where we have a unique, um, you know, a, a unique influence in the sense that we can harness that industrial power, we can use that the fact that we're part of a global movement to build support and solidarity um, for Palestinian workers. Obviously, right now, the movement, all of us are focused on, on our members, on the key workers on the front line, and we share, you know, many similar issues around testing, around PPE. But as you've heard from, from colleagues already, the, the COVID situation is simply also exacerbating and exposing existing injustices, existing inequality um, and exploitation. And it's really bringing that into sharp focus um, and the lack of infrastructure, the lack of healthcare and the repression that Palestinians face is being exposed ever clearer. Um, we've been calling for increased international coordination, for, for more solidarity and internationalism at, at this moment. It's not a moment to just be looking inwards. Um, and we, we also know there's a danger that regimes that are repressing um, people are also going to take advantage of this crisis to, to further their agendas. Um, obviously, with, with Palestine, you know, there's more experts than me on the situation for workers' rights, but this crisis isn't happening in a vacuum. Um, the situation, the, the backdrop of Trump's so-called Middle East peace plan, you know, something that 
the international trade union movement has condemned a plan that we know will embolden further violations of, of international humanitarian law with increase in settlements, potential annexations, that it tramples on the right to self-determination, um, the right to, to return. And I think we need to make sure that we don't lose sight of the context, um, the current context um, that Palestine is facing. Um, and that we bring our international attention, we don't let ourselves get diverted um, from our solidarity work and we obviously adapt to the current situation and see how we can build support for the Palestinian people. So we're, you know, as a movement continuing our, our solidarity work, we have no intention of, of stopping that. I know the trade union like coordinate action um, advisory committee of, of Palestine Solidarity Campaign is still really active and affiliates have been doing a brilliant job, the NEU, Unite, organizing fringe meetings, organizing events, and obviously um, welcome the, the huge win um, of the case yesterday that PSC and affiliates supported. Um, and it really is quite a landmark moment. So I just wanted to place on up record our support um, and just to make clear that we are still an internationalist movement and we need to build our solidarity work more than ever right now. Thanks, Mariella. That was uh, excellent. And uh, it's been really good. Uh, I'm part of the PSC trade union group and Mariella has joined that group and it's been really good working with her. And um, it's clear that the TUC are very keen to take up uh, the issue of Palestine and workers' rights um, and people's rights there. Um, right, we've got a few questions now, so I'm going to go to Abed first. Um, so the first question is from a trade unionist from the FBU, um, the Fire Brigades Union here, who um, are affiliated um, to PSC but have done lots of work, and I know they've taken delegations out to Palestine, um, but he asks, uh, how can we forge more links with groups of workers um, out there. So how can people here, trade unionists here uh, and trade union branches forge more links with groups of workers out in the occupied um, Palestinian territories is his question. And I should have unmuted you. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, you hear me? Yes. I, I don't have the, the, the question. Uh, can you repeat it? I can repeat it, yes. Uh, so he asked uh, somebody from one of our trade unions how they can forge better links with groups of workers out in Palestine. Uh, if I wanted to, to answer this question, uh, you should ask the unions uh, uh, how to be in contact with them. I am, uh, we are uh, in our uh, association, uh, we are in contact with the unions, but the problem for the workers, they didn't have the ability to be united in their works. Uh, many of the workers afraid from the employees that if they hear that they are united, they will be fired from the work. So many of the workers prefer not to be uh, in, in connect with the, with unions because they are afraid of from firing from the work. If that I answer their questions. Okay, I see what you mean. But I think uh, uh, it, it's links with unions here rather than unions there. But uh, we will uh, maybe we'll talk to you about that and see what we think. I'll have a chat with others. Um, just moving on, because we've got quite a few questions and I, I do want to try and get through them. Um, uh, somebody's asked a question about the proportion, you talked about workers going into Israel uh, and what proportion of those are women and the impact that that has had on their families. So I don't know if you know the proportion of those workers. I mean, Samia may also be able to, uh, to answer that. I think she's indicated very low numbers of workers are women. Um, but do you have any views on that? It was a question directed at you. About women? Uh, yes, proportion of women who go into Israel to work. The workers that, the Palestinian workers that go into Israel, how many of those would be women? It's not a huge number. It's a few numbers, uh, especially they are going to work in the agriculture sector. 
uh, that's in common inside Israel. Uh, this uh, hundreds of women, not more than, that they are going to work inside Israel. But there is uh, the same numbers inside in the settlements, like women working in laundry, in, uh, in inside the settlements in housekeeping or cleaning, uh, something like this. It's a number of hundreds, not more than. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Right, I'm going to go to Samia now because I've got some questions for you. Um, so uh, I'm going to pin your video and see if you appear. Ah, oh, you're unmuted as well. So Samia, um, a couple of questions for you. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. The, the line is a bit uh, unstable. Is a bit funny. I've just seen that, but you, you yeah. seem to hear it again now, Samia. So um, the first question, uh, somebody's asked about the source that you, you commented on the number of COVID cases. What was your source for that and whether you trust the WHO data? I mean, I, I tend to use the uh, data, but I don't know where you got your data from on the number of cases. Uh, it's from uh, the Palestinian Authority. It's uh, not from uh, the WHO. So the Palestinian Authority counts these uh, cases. And uh, um, I mean, the ones in the West Bank are all in uh, uh, under quarantine. They're in quarantine centers. The, the ones in Jerusalem uh, are not. Uh, they're either in their houses or some of them in hospitals. But uh, yeah, the situation really is in shambles in Jerusalem. So that's the source, the PA, the Palestinian Authority. Lovely, thanks for that. Um, and then you talked about the difficulty with ventilators. Uh, somebody said that they understand that. What is the, um, how, how easy is it for you, for Palestinians to access PPE, personal and protective equipment um, to, for when they're treating people or um, dealing with people? Yeah, it hasn't been so bad here. Actually, we've been seeing how bad it is in Europe with the PPE equipment and so on. Uh, it hasn't been bad here because of the number of cases. Uh, there have been, you know, 507 is, is not a huge number. So, and actually none of the 507 needed a ventilator. So there were no cases that had to use that. Um, uh, we don't really, we didn't run down on anything. Um, uh, we hear that there were shortage in supplies in Europe, in the US. Here, there was nothing of that. I think because of the low number of, of uh, cases. So uh, there hasn't been issues really in that uh, area. Again, you know, our numbers in the West Bank were 98% of the cases are in the West Bank. Um, the uh, the population, we're 5 million, you know, we're like a neighborhood in London. That's also, we have to see that in perspective. Uh, so 5 million, that's a large neighborhood in, in London. That's the population. Sorry, in the West Bank, we're 3 million. We're 5 million in the West Bank and Gaza. So 3 million, if we look into uh, 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 there are 500 cases in the West Bank and very, you know, seven cases in, in the Gaza Strip. Um, these 500 cases and the 3 million people are very, very small numbers. So the health sector has not been uh, uh, pressured and we hope it will not because it really cannot take any, any uh, sort of pressure. In terms of the Palestinian women workers in Israel, they're only 1% of the uh, 140,000 Palestinian workers. So that works out to be 1,400, as Abid said. Uh, uh, they're very, their numbers are not large and very many of them actually work in the settlements rather than cross into Israel. Okay, and then uh, another question, just about the imbalance of trade between Israel and the occupied territories. Are Palestinian goods, question, is there, you know, what, what is the impact of that? And are Palestinian goods allowed into Israel, is the question. Uh, Palestinian goods are uh, allowed into Israel depending on Israel's needs. If Israel usually imports from the West Bank uh, vegetables, uh, and uh, exports to the West Bank uh, fruits. 
uh, Israel imports our vegetables because our vegetables are watered with untreated water, you know, just uh, uh, rain water and ground water. We don't have uh, sewage water. We don't irrigate our agriculture with sewage water, treated sewage water. Israel does that. So what Israel does actually, it sells us its uh, uh, vegetables, which is uh, watered with a treated sewage and takes our vegetables that are um, uh, watered with, you know, just drain fed water and, and so on. Uh, so that trade still goes on. And so Israel takes uh, that anything that Israel does not uh, want to uh, import from the West Bank, Israel does not uh, take it at the moment even if it is in violation of uh, the Oslo agreements. So everything is done in our trade relations in uh, uh, accordance with Israel's interests. Um, it's still, you know, it requires, for example, uh, building material, stones from the Palestinians. It would import stones. But for example, it doesn't need so much uh, uh, plastics at the moment, so it wouldn't import that. So there is still a trade movement um, between the Palestinians and Israel, but it's very much dated by Israel's needs and requirements. Okay, lovely. Uh, just another question for you, and then I'm going to take a question for Abed. So do the Israeli unions and the joint list raise the issue of Israeli employers underpaying Palestinian workers and breaking agreements about pay levels and accommodation, sleeping accommodation? We haven't heard of any of that. Um, on the contrary, I mean, they're totally silent and uh, um, the images of how the Palestinian workers have been uh, treated during this uh, pandemic are very clear to everyone. And we haven't heard any objection, any clarification, any a remark by any Israeli trade unionist saying, you know, you have to pay workers. Palestinian workers are mostly paid in cash. Um, this is in order for two reasons. Um, the first one is that many of them do not have permits, hence, you know, they're under Israeli law, they're illegal workers. Uh, the other reason has to do with the fact that if you pay in cash you do not have you're not obligated to the workers other rights so the vast majority of palestinian workers with permits and without permits are actually paid in cash uh, in order to be paid in cash you have to actually go to your workplace so palestinian workers who haven't been going to their workplace have not been paid and uh, yes, trade, Israeli trade unions have not voiced any concern about the non-payment of Palestinian workers, the living conditions of workers when they were there, the manner with which the Israeli authorities uh, and the army has been dumping Palestinian workers at checkpoints. Um, also the manner with which workers in Jerusalem uh, are treated. You know, people are getting infected and they don't have access to healthcare. Palestinians who try to provide healthcare, say, for example, um, uh, trying to organize the small Palestinian hospitals in Jerusalem. These have been, um, Israel's measures have worked to undermine these uh, efforts by uh, the Palestinians. Um, so uh, the Israeli trade union movement actually works, you know, as part and parcel of Israel's colonial uh, uh, hegemony and domination. Uh, it reinforces that, uh, it, uh, it works, it's silent, but not even just silent, it knows and uh, uh, does not take action, does not uh, raise any uh, concern about uh, Palestinian uh, workers. So it's not really very different from the Israeli army. Okay, thanks. Just before, um, we've had a couple of questions about the social security law, which I think you have responded to, but maybe you ought to just clarify that because clearly it's come up again a couple of times. We do not have actually a social security law. There was an attempt a few years ago to um, 
uh, in a way set up one for the West Bank and Gaza and the workers demonstrated against it because um, be in a way there, there, there were a lot of loopholes and people were very weary that their money is going to be lost by the PA or the PA is going to use this money to finance uh, whatever. So they rallied uh, very, very uh, strongly against it and it was defeated. So we do not have a social security law. The PA, the Palestinian Authority, actually, probably for the first time since it's set up, uh, it has been acting uh, in the interest of people. That's the first time the Palestinians actually have felt that by uh, setting up checkpoints at the entrances of towns and villages and uh, trying to organize uh, how things are done. Um, there has been funds that are established. There has been a lot of uh, food support to poorer families, but in a way there is more to life than food. So families have uh, other uh, expenses to pay, you know, rent and, and so on. Uh, actually, Israeli, Palestinian workers in Israel are a concern, but the other concern is daily workers, Palestinians who work uh, on daily basis, earn their wages um, on daily basis. These have been, the, the vast majority of these workers are uh, the ones uh, of concern. Uh, Palestinian workers in Israel are better off, you know, their wages are much higher. They earn nearly 300 uh, shekels per day, while Palestinian workers inside the West Bank earn on average between 80 and 100 shekels. So they earn nearly a third of what Palestinian workers in Israel and hence their standards of living are much, much uh, worse than workers in Israel. So these workers, daily workers, uh, who uh, earn their wages or their living on daily, basis, on daily basis are the ones who are being very badly affected. Uh, the PA is trying to support, but mostly it's really social networks. People rely on their families, on you know their extended families, neighbors. I mean, in at university, what we did is we were asked by the um, administration and the union. They both had funds, and we were asked to sponsor students. So we, in a way, each one of us paid huge amounts of money actually to sponsor students. And then we, because the company that cleans at the university is a private company. So the workers are daily workers in that company. So we donated part of our wages to these workers. So this is the manner with which people have been coping here. Um, the few that remained to earn their, uh, remained earning their wages are bailing out everyone else. We don't know how, how much longer we can go on like this. Um, but that's management of the crisis. What's important is what comes after that. Thanks, Samia. Uh, we, have, uh, we are coming very close to the end. I just wanted to bring Abed back in just very briefly, um, just uh, because uh, I just wanted to ask Abed what he thought we could, um, what else we could do here to support workers there. I don't know if you've got any comments on that, Abed. Uh, I, want, I want to mention three things uh, briefly about uh, the asking the, the questions that you asked it. Uh, the history route, the unions, Israeli unions, did not involve in this situation. They did not help any Palestinians, workers uh, in this situation. The other thing, uh, there is a amount of money for the sick days. The, the Israeli uh, deduct from the workers for uh, sick fees. Uh, the amount of money, uh, it's 500 billion, billion, sh million shekel. Uh, in the in 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 uh, in the, 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 the in, uh, in Israel, and uh, recently Kavlaved uh, go to the Supreme Court to ask this amount why you didn't uh, pay for the Palestinians who didn't have ability to work in this uh, period. 
Uh, until now, there is uh, no answer from the Supreme Court. Uh, and the other thing that uh, we are uh, going to do, to, uh, we, we, st we, we go to the Supreme Court to ask them to cover the Palestinians who are uh, going to work inside Israel uh, on Sunday. They are going to be more than 50,000 workers will go inside Israel to work. We ask the, the court to, to, uh, to manage for them a health care if they infected in the work from the corona or COVID-19 to be covered. Uh, we hope to succeed in that. Uh, your uh, solidarity with the Palestinians uh, known in all the time. And uh, I don't know what you are, can do for the Palestinian workers, but in fact, uh, there is no ability to now to to be in touch with uh, with unions and others. Until now, we are uh, we are connect, we are separated from each of the other. Just in phones, we are talking. I don't have an idea how to to deal with that. No problem. Thanks, Abed, and thanks for Welcome. your uh, uh, comments. They were very informative. Okay, we've come to an end of, uh, of our webinar. I want to really thank all of our speakers, Samia, Abed, and Mariella. Thank you. Um, there are lots thank of act actions in the chat, so we will make sure we email those out to you. Um, don't forget, Sylvia has reminded me that it's a Puma Day of Action on Monday the 4th, so make sure you check out our actions for Monday. Uh, and as I said, we're doing a NACBAR rally, so we, uh, make sure you sign up for that. Um, we'll be organizing other events. Sign up to our email list. Make sure, make sure you join PSC, and please make sure you donate if you can. Uh, we're working hard, um, but it's really good to see our friends from Palestine here with us this evening, and thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you all thank for, you for all of us. giving up your time. And stay safe, everyone. Take care. Thank Have you. A nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.